want to talk to you this morning about the fear of the Lord. And uh, uh, I had another sermon, but this morning in prayer, the Lord dealt with me about the fear of the Lord. Lord, we ask you to open this up to us that we may fear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Beginning with Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now Israel, that's the church of the Old Testament, where the church of the New Testament is supposed to be. Saying what applied to them applies to us here. Especially in this case, what does the Lord your God require of you? People say, I just wish I knew what the Lord wanted me to do. I just wish I knew the will of God. I just wish whatever. Well, here's an answer. What does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God. That's number one. To fear the Lord your God. Everything else has to come out of that. To walk in all His ways, not the ways we like, or that please us, or that fit our agenda. And to love Him, and look at that, that's number three on this list. To love Him. And to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. To keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I command you this day for your good. Who's good? Our good. Our good. It's for our good that we fear the Lord, our God. Now to fear the Lord is to be a witness for the Lord. People say, well, I want to be a witness for the Lord. I want my life to be a witness for the Lord. But to fear the Lord is to be a witness for the Lord. People watching us, they see what we fear. They see what moves us, so to speak. But to fear the Lord is to be witness for the Lord. We're saying that He's more important to me than anyone or anything. No matter what we claim or say, if we do not fear the Lord, we cannot be a witness unto Him if we do not fear Him. For our actions will prove us to be a false witness. We can sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. But if we do not fear Jesus, we will not obey Him. I fear a lot of things, I, you know. And I love a lot of things. I love ice cream, but I don't fear ice cream. You know, I... I I appreciate fire when it's cold, but I fear what fire can do if it gets out of its place. Water's wonderful, but you, you have to fear water if a flood's coming or that will destroy things. Now, we will obey the one we love the most because we fear losing our relationship with him. This is important this morning. We'll obey the one we love the most because... We fear losing our relationship with Him. If you don't really matter to me, I'm, you know, if I don't really love you, I'm not going to fear losing your relationship. You know, I'll say something like, hey, life was good before you came. Life will be okay when you leave, you know. You're not that important to me. But to fear losing our relationship with the Lord, that's what we're really talking about, fearing the Lord. You know, the Lord's only going to put up with so much off of a person. I mean things that are not right. He's only going to put up with so much of that. I don't know where the line is, where His mercy stops and His chastisement or judgment begins. I don't know. You don't know. We must not presume that we know. Some have, and it's really not turned out well at all for them. So... It must be this way with us and the Lord. I love Him. I love Him enough to fear losing my relationship with Him. But how can we both love the Lord and fear the Lord at the same time? Hebrews 12, 9. 
Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, that's our earthly fathers, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits, that's God in heaven, and live? Now, I loved my heavenly father, my earthly father, I loved my heavenly father, but I loved my earthly father, but I also feared my earthly father. Because I knew that if I disobeyed him, or if I brought shame upon him, that he'd punish me. He had no problem doing that. I loved him, but I feared him. The combination of love and fear are an enduring bond that cannot be broken. Love, fear. Fear, love. The combination of loving and fearing God is an eternal bond. Listen. That it's a eternal bond that produces oneness with him. My love for him of itself will not produce oneness with him. But if I love him and I fear him, there will be oneness with him. Not him changing to what I am, but me changing to what he is. Not him doing what pleases me, but me doing what pleases him. Not my will being done, but his will being done. If we go back up to our, our scripture here, it says we're to fear the Lord, and then it says we're to love Him. So we see both of these have to come into play always, every day in our relationship with Him. To just sing, oh, how I love, how I love Jesus, but not to fear Him, will never produce the righteousness that God demands, or the oneness. The whole purpose is that we become one with Him. We must become one with him. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, the whole theme of that prayer was oneness with him. He prayed, Jesus prayed that they may be one with us. One with us. And so that has to, that has to happen. That's what God's after. You know, there's a scripture in, uh, in Peter that says, I think it's 1 Peter chapter 2, it says they went out from us because they were not of us. And the fact that they went out from us was proof that they were not of us. And for me to be of the Lord, I have to, I have to become one with Him. See, they went out because they were not one with us. So this in and out thing that comes in our lives. We're sitting in church and... And you know a lot of people go to church and get blessed out of their socks and oh hallelujah, praise God. And, and that's good. But if we walk out that door and we don't live right, and I'm not saying right by what I think or you think, but if we don't obey Him and be led of the Holy Spirit, all this that happened in here is a sham. It's just all about us and getting our spiritual funny bone tickled, you know, and so we can feel good. Crying tears, whatever we do. Where's the fear of the Lord? That's what he talked to me about this one. Where is the fear of the Lord in his own house? Among his own people? What do we mean fearing him? I'm not speaking so much about, you know, if I, if I don't do this or that, he's going to kill me or he's going to send me to hell. I'm talking about the relationship. You, you, we cannot be disobedient and, and continue to have that relationship with Him that's so necessary, absolutely necessary. It's an eternal bond that produces oneness with Him because it causes us to submit to Him. He doesn't submit to us, we submit to Him. We don't tell God what to do, He tells us what to do. we got to get that straight. We got to figure out which one's God and which one's the servant, you know. And it's and we're not the God, so we must be the servant. And to do His will instead of doing our own will. And then He says, "Wherefore we receive it, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire." Now it's not that if we if we venture off and we don't pr 
practice fearing God and being in obedience to Him. It's not that we're going straight to hell immediately, but it means that He's going to tighten the screws down a little bit, maybe a lot. You know what I'm saying? That we're going to fear, feel the heat of the flame. He's a consuming fire. You know what I'm talking about this morning. I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation every time you mess up. But we have learned that God knows how to deal with us. And I don't enjoy that. Do you? I don't enjoy when he cracks the whip. Oh, God doesn't do that. He loves. Well, you, we need to go back and read this chapter 12. Every son he receives, he scourges. That speaks of, of beating with a whip. Do you fear that? Some, it's a wonderful place, if we can come to it, to where we fear his, dis, his displeasure. I don't know about you, but I'm going along in the, through the day, and I, suddenly I, I realize I don't feel his presence. Now, if you never felt his presence, you don't know what I'm talking about. And why haven't you felt his presence? What, what you been running after? But if I go along and all this, I don't, I, I, I come to realize that I don't feel his presence. What happened? I start, I start backtracking. When did it happen? Then why did it happen? What did I say? What did I do? Where did I go? What did I look at? What did I listen to? That I lost his presence. And I'll tell you that, his presence means everything to me. You don't. My stuff doesn't. He does. His presence. I don't mean this ugly. I'm not. You, and, but you got. We all have to come to this place. I can live without you, and I can live without the stuff, but I can't live without His presence. But as long as you feel like you need somebody, somebody's relationship and somebody's stuff more than you need Him, the devil's gonna. He'll defeat you. You're you're already defeated. You're going down. It's a matter of time. He is a consuming fire. That doesn't mean just hellfire, folks. That's not exactly what it's talking about there. Talking about he's going to turn the heat up and burn some stuff out of you or out of me. And he knows how. Oh, my, he knows how. We, we burn some trash out here, and sometimes if the lighter doesn't you know, work, we can't burn the trash. We don't know how to rub the stick and all that stuff there. <laughs> And so, but I'll tell you what, his lighter always works. <laughs> Are you hearing me this morning? His lighter always works. Never runs out of butane, propane, whatever's in that thing. It does not run out. He's very skillful too. You know, some people stand out there for 30 minutes trying to light that fire till they run, run the lighter empty. He is quick. He knows how. Woo, he knows how. It amazes me here. How long have you been living? You don't have to tell me, but how long you been alive? Oh, but we just this short time we've been alive, we know everything now. Really? You know how long he's been around? Forever. And ever and ever. And all of a sudden, we come on the scene that I know as much as God knows. That's amazing, isn't it? It's just absolutely amazing. It's like a young person telling an older person how things, how things are. If you're old enough yet, you know. You look at him and say, Oh, God have mercy on you, kid. <laughs> you, go, you got some things to learn. God has to look at us and say, Oh, have mercy on this child. Oh, you got some things to learn. Well, praise God. There's much to fear in life, but the greatest fear is the fear of loss. Of losing our life. Of losing the relationship. Of losing our freedom. Losing our income, losing our reputation, losing pleasures or comforts. You know, there are people that kill themselves because, and we've seen this, they've done something and they just can't face the consequences. They can't face the shame. It's not that they can't fa face death because they killed themselves, but they just cannot face the shame, the loss of their reputation. So they commit suicide. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I remember many years ago there was a bank and uh, a lot of my relatives had money in that bank 
fact, one of them owned a little store, and they rushed on Friday to get the money in the bank. On Sunday, the banker committed suicide. You know why? Because the bank was insolvent, and he let his insurance lapse. And he didn't want to face the people. He, he couldn't stand the loss of his reputation. All of us fear someone or something, but we choose whom or what we'll fear. We will not obey those that we do not fear. How many children have you seen the parent tell them don't do that and they just keep right on doing it? And I'm afraid. I'm going to get you. They keep right on doing it. Why? Because you haven't got them. That's why. They have already learned that. They're pretty smart. It doesn't take them long to learn it, does it? It doesn't take us long to learn. Out of fear of losing a relationship, we'll submit to the one we love the most no matter what it costs us. Genesis 22, 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, Here I am. And he said, That's, it's in, Why does it say that here I am? Because he doesn't run and hide like Adam and Eve did. He said, I'm here. I'm listening. And God said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Whom you love. Why does God go after the things we love when he's testing us? The people we love. And get you into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you of. And Abraham rose up early that morning. Abraham doesn't have to wait three months to figure out if it's God talking to him or not. Abraham's also learning, we have to learn this. The longer you wait to do the will of God, the more you, the possibility you talk yourself out of doing it or somebody else will talk you out of doing it. He saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God had told him. This place, by the way, is the Temple Mount today in Jerusalem. Then on the third day, Abraham, and that's interesting because, listen, God had his eye on that Mount Moriah. He had his eye on it before the children of Israel ever made it their capital, Jerusalem. And it's a, so I'm just saying that to say that God has places. And he has a place on this earth that's very important to him. It's the apple of his eye. He'll defend it. He's going to defend it. You know that? That's coming. When they come against Jerusalem, there's going to be a final time. God said, that's the last. You know Jerusalem's already been destroyed, I believe it's 26 times. Totally destroyed. When I went there, uh, they took us down under the ground, and we walked through there where they'd excavated out shops and things and streets under all the rubble that's been pulled down on top of it. And then more pulled down on top of it. But there's coming a time he said, not again. You're not going to do it again. And it says he's going to come and with the, with the sword of his mouth, he's going to defeat all the armies of the world that come against that place. On the third day, he lifted up his eyes. It's a three-day journey and saw the place afar off. And they came to the place which the God had told him up. And Abraham built an altar there. And he laid the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He's ready. And the angel of the Lord called him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Who is the angel of the Lord? This is, this is interesting. But it's, this angel of the Lord is Christ himself appearing in the Old Testament. It's the very person who was represented by this offering. Isaac is a representation of Christ. Dying for our sins. And Abraham is a representation of the Father giving his son. And then the Christ who is being represented appears himself and says, Abraham, do not touch the boy. Now, for, if you want to see the proof of that, you look on down to verses 16 and 17 that it is Christ himself. Verse 12, and he said, the Lord said, The angel of the Lord, which is the Lord, lay not your hand on the lad, neither do anything to him. For now, listen to this, for now I know 
that you fear God. For now I know that you fear God. Please hear this this morning. You're going to come. God's going to bring you to places and test you to see if you fear Him or not. This is the test. This is not a chapter test. It's not a unit test. It's the test. Could you have passed this test? This test, Abraham, could you have passed this test? Most people say, well, that's not God. God wouldn't tell me to do something like that. How many times have we said that? How many times has the Lord spoken to you and you said, oh, God wouldn't ask me to do that? He gave me this car. He gave me this house. He gave me this. He, whatever. Be assured that God will take back what He gave you. Be assured that He gave it to you to see if you give it back. Are you hearing that? He will give it to you to see if you'll give it back. What did Job say? The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's when he lost everything including his ten children in one day. For I know that you fear the Lord, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. That's why this man Abraham is so important. That's why he's such a famous man. That's why people name their children Abraham. You know, religions have come out of this man. Some of them false, but they've come out of this man. Called a friend of God. That's why in, in the plain of Mamre, when, when the Lord appears with two other two angels and they appear there, and as the Lord's walking away, he turns around, he, he says to himself, shall I, shall I hide this from Abraham, seeing that he will order his family after me? How does the Lord know that? Here. Because he, he, he knows what Abraham's going to do. Now, Abraham hasn't had that son yet, but he knows what Abraham's going to do. Is the Lord proven correct? Yes. Now, I want to tell you this, when we get ready for the Lord will test all of us. Get ready. And he will know for sure if we fear him or not. It may be our job. It may be, I don't know what it will be. Years ago, I, I, I need to, years ago there was a man, many, many years ago, there was a man in the, well, he didn't really come to church very, two or three times I saw him. But his wife always came. His wife died. And I went to visit him. And he was crying uncontrollably there in his living room. And, and then he said to me, he said, you know, I never told her why I quit coming to church. He had gotten saved, started coming to church, then he quit. He said, I never told her. And he regretted that he never told her. But he worked for the county. And one day it was raining, they couldn't work. So they played dominoes usually when it was raining. And they'd bet a penny on that game. And in his heart he felt like he could no longer do that. So it came down to, you going to play? You're going to play. And he made a choice. He was going to play. I don't, I, for myself, I can't see how you're going to go to hell over a penny. Betting a penny, but you know. It was a conviction to him. You understand what I'm saying? It was a conviction to him. So he played. And he felt like all was lost. He felt like he had done wrong. And he, he quit coming. I believe it was a setup of the devil. All these things are setups. But it was a test for him. And he failed the test. He couldn't say to those guys, you know what? I, I just don't believe I can gamble that penny anymore. People. It wasn't over a penny. It was over, are you going to stand up for the Lord or not? And the test is coming to all of us. Who do we fear? Those guys that we work with or him? Who do we fear? And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham, and this is so much in here about 
The law of Moses hasn't even been given yet, which required such a sacrifice of an animal. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. In the Jehovah Jireh, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. But let me, let me don't, we can't just go around saying that. Where will the Lord provide for us? Where did it say? In the mount of the Lord. Not in the place of our choosing. You know, Abraham can go along about two days. See, you know, I'm tired of traveling. I'll just go right up here and do this. You can't do that. Where did the Lord provide? In the mount of the Lord. I had a dream years ago, and I was in a ditch, and all disheveled and this. Terrible looking. And I, I, I saw myself in the dream. I was there. And people come by and say, you need to get out of this ditch and go on. I said, I can't. The Lord told me to stay right here. And so i got to stay here because if he comes and I'm not here, I'll miss him. It's the place, folks, it's the place he tells you to be at. I'm not just talking about physical locations either. Don't be on a job God didn't give you. Don't live in a house he didn't put you in. Don't, you, you understand all that. You know, that's, that's very elementary in the first place. How many people call themselves children of God, call themselves the people of God, and everything they've got around them is of something of their own choice that their flesh wanted, and none of it's God. Just totally out of order. Just totally out of order. What do we do when we find out we have missed God on something? I really can't tell you that this morning. But you've got to go to the Lord and see what he says to do about it. In the book of Nehemiah, they found themselves out of order. The men had disobeyed the word of the Lord, the law of Moses, and had taken to themselves wives of foreign nations. You know what they had to do? They had to send those wives back with their children. I heard the other day how many thousands of this involved. It was tremendous. Well, our po population of our city is going to go down if we do that. We can't do that. You know? I'm sure those men love those women and love those children. Abraham faced the same test. He had to send Ishmael away, whom he loved. Now, where does the Lord provide for us? In the mount of the Lord, in the place that the Lord leads us to, not to the place of our choice or our desire. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I'm sworn. See, this is where we know it's Christ. Said the Lord, said the Lord, For because you have done this thing and have not withhold, held your son, your only son, that in blessing, here's, here's the reward, for fearing the Lord. Here's the reward. That in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. He proved his obedience. He proved his fear of the Lord by his obedience. Now, he's saying that all the nations of the earth will be blessed because his seed, of his seed. Who is that seed going to be? Christ the Lord. Come forth out of Abraham's seed. But let me say this this morning to all of us. Christ must come from someone's seed. And is he going to come out of us? Is the Lord going to come out of us? He said, Christ is going to come out of you, Abraham, because you feared me. He has to come from someone's seed, and it is out of this man, this man, that God chooses to bring forth his son in the flesh upon this earth to represent him. Now I want to give you some facts concerning the fear of the Lord. There's nothing dirty or unrighteous about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not a one-time activity. Psalm 19, 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The Lord will not force us to fear Him in this life. 
Therefore, it's up to us to choose to fear the Lord in all things, 2 Chronicles 19, 7. Wherefore, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Let it be. He won't force you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. What does the Lord, what is he looking for? Not some bribe. What's the Lord looking for? Not our us doing something for, I'm going to build this for you, Lord, if you do. No, what's he looking for? That we fear him. Now, Proverbs uh, eight thirteen: the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and ar arrogance and the evil way, and the perverted mouth do I hate. Now, the things we hate prove whether or not we fear the Lord. Do we fear, do we hate what he hates? Proverbs 15, 16, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is little with the fear of the Lord. The pursuit of the fear of the Lord and the pursuit of wealth is what we see here. And they have no common ground and they have no common results. Proverbs 23, 17, Let not your heart envy sinners. But you be in the fear of the Lord all the day long. This is telling us to what extent and how long should we fear the Lord. Isaiah 11, 1, And there came forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, Jesse being the father of David, a descent, all descendants of Abraham, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel, and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Isn't that in it? This is speaking of Christ. And we see Christ our example in all things. In all things is going to fear his heavenly Father. The fear of the Lord does not come from a fear of punishment. Hear this. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The fear of the Lord should not come from a fear of punishment. But it is a spirit of fear of displeasing the Lord. And it comes only from the Holy Spirit working in us. A spirit of fearing the Lord. I know there's some bad spirits out there. Do you know that? I've had some come on me. I've had a spirit of fear, but it's not a spirit of fear in the Lord. It's a spirit of fear of something else. Only the Holy Spirit can give you the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I want that. I want him to give me a spirit of fear of the Lord. I can't trust my own self to have this fear. We cannot. Oh, I'm going to fear the Lord. Not unless a spirit of fear comes from the Lord. A spirit of fear of the Lord from the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Speaking of Christ, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. I love to fear the Lord. He said, I love to fear my heavenly Father. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or reprove by what his ears hear. Now Christ did not judge by what he saw or by what he heard, and oh Lord, deliver us from that. But he judged according to his fear of displeasing his heavenly Father. What does the Father say about this? There's a, and I want to, I want to have to, I need to stop saying, he didn't have to, every instant stop saying, Lord, what do you say about this? The Holy Spirit would tell him. He'd become conscious of it. Praise God. It, folks, it's not that hard. You hear me? It's not that hard if you're walking with him. One thing is for sure. When it's not right, your spirit should be disturbed. Because the Holy Spirit's in there. Stirring us. There's a place in the Lord where we delight in fearing him. And out of that delight comes all our words and all our actions. Verse 4, but with the righteous he shall judge the poor, reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod or the sword of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Now this is a prophecy yet to come, spoken of also in, the, in Revelation. Isaiah 33, 6, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Now, what's your treasure? That's the fear of the Lord is a treasure unlike anything the world knows about. The fear of the Lord should be our treasure. I'm going to protect the fear of the Lord in me. 
You know, why is he saying? Because you keep overriding the fear of the Lord and you won't have the fear of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 24, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes or laws, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is today. Deuteronomy 10, 20, You shall fear the Lord your God, him shall you serve, and to him shall you hold and swear by his name. Fearing the Lord is not an option. Fear coming from gratitude. 1 Samuel 12, 24, Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things He's done for you. Now we are to teach the fear of the Lord, both by our words and our actions, and especially to our children. We should teach the fear of the Lord, and not just to fear, but how to fear the Lord. 2 Kings 17, 20 says, And taught them how they should fear the Lord. Here's some ways to teach others how to fear the Lord. Psalm 15, 4, In whose eyes a vile person is contempt, and he honors them that fears the Lord. Friends, your children, they're going to see who you honor. Do you honor them that fear the Lord? Your fellow employees, people who work for you or you work for, they're going to see who you honor. Do you honor those that fear the Lord? But in Romans chapter 1, we, we read where they not only do evil, they have pleasure in others that do evil. They honor them. I tell you, let someone in Hollywood do something really bad, and you know what? They'll circle the wagons around them and support them. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-three: 23, You that fear the Lord, praise Him. Praise Him. Psalm, and, and, and that's a teaching thing. If your children hear you praising the Lord, your friends. Psalm 33, 8, Stand in awe of Him. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. If you stand in awe of the Lord, then you're teaching people how that you fear the Lord. Psalm 115, 11, You that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The, by the fact that we trust in Him, we teach people that they should also fear the Lord. Psalm 118, 4, Let them now that fear the Lord say that His mercy endures forever. Proverbs 3, 7, Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. People see how we're doing this. Deuteronomy 13, 4, You shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear Him, and keep His commandments, obey His voice, and you shall serve Him, and join to Him. Now, by honoring the memory of those who feared the Lord, we teach the value of fearing the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a woman, and her husband died, and she had two boys, and the creditors were going to come and take her boys to pay for the debt. And she went to the man of God, Elisha, and she said, You know that you're that you know that my husband feared the Lord. And so Elisha, you know what he did, got him to bring by all the vessels he could, and she had a little oil and start pouring it, and it kept on going till there was no more vessels. They sold it, paid off the debt. Why? Because her husband had feared the Lord. Matthew 10, 28, and fear not them, this is Christ speaking, which kill the body, which are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And in Luke 12, 5, but I will forewarn you who, whom you shall fear. Fear him, which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Who do you think that's talking about? It's talking about the Lord. If we fear man, Hear me, if we have one ounce of fear of man in us, the devil will defeat us over that. Now, the benefits of fearing the Lord. The benefits. Only those who are full of themselves, and because they're full of themselves, they're antichrist. Full of themselves, they're antichrist. Only those who are full of themselves have a problem with fearing the Lord. But those who are denying their self, taking up their cross daily and following the Lord, delight in fearing the Lord. And they will be well rewarded for their fear of the Lord. Second Chronicles 17.10 And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. You know why? Because he had really brought a revival in that nation. And even sent out the princes to teach the people the word of the Lord. And the Lord honored that. And, he, and the fear of the Lord fell on those people. Psalm 111.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
Proverbs 1 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1 29, and for they that hated knowledge, they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 10 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs days. But the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Proverbs 14, 26, and the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Proverbs 16, 6, by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. You quit sinning when you fear the Lord. Proverbs 19, 20, I'm telling you that this morning. If we're having a problem obeying God, it's because we do not fear Him. This nation we're living in has a, does not fear the Lord. Could this promise have significance concerning the saints escaping the great tribulation? Yes. I'm, 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 people say, well, the church is going to go through the great tribulation to purify it. That's not the purpose of the great tribulation. The purpose of the great tribulation, which the scripture says, never has been that bad, never will be again. The purpose is the wrath of God poured out upon sinners. It's not to purify the church. And they don't even have a scripture to stand on to even say that kind of thing. The fear of the Lord leads to life. He that has it shall be satisfied. What? He shall not be visited with evil. Acts 9.31 Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified or built up, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit go together. Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Praise God. Hallelujah. Fear the Lord and you don't have to be afraid of anyone else. When we fear the Lord, we need not fear man or what man can do. Psalm 34, 9, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for there's no want to them that fear him. No want, no lacking. Psalm 115, 13, He will bless him that fear the Lord, both small and great. Psalm 25, 14, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he shall show them his covenant, or perform toward them his promises. Do you hear that? The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. He's going to show you things that nobody else is going to know or see, because you fear him. Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, on them that hope in His mercy. Psalm 34, 7, The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear Him and delivers them. Psalm 85, 9, Surely His salvation is near them that fear Him, that glory may dwell in their land. Psalm 103, 11, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Psalm 103, 13, Like as the Father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to them that fear him. Psalm 103, 17, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. Now that's interesting. You, if you will fear the Lord, I don't, it doesn't matter what your grandpa did. I'm talking about what they call generational curses, passed down generations. And you got to go somewhere and get someone to break that curse off for you. No. You fear the Lord, you'll break that curse. Because he said, he said it very plainly, and his righteousness to children's children. Who to? Who is that to? Those that fear him. You can break that chain. Praise God, hallelujah. Psalm 111.5 He has given food to them that fear Him, and He will ever be mindful of His covenant. Psalm 145.19 He will fulfill the desire of them that fear Him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. Psalm 147 you, You're not going to lose fear in the Lord. What is fear? Fear that we're going to lose something. Oh, if I... If I obey God, if I do that, I'm going to lose my friend. Well, look at all these benefits you get. Can your friend do these things for you? Can the government do it? Can your employer? 
Psalm 147, 11, the Lord, the Lord takes pleasure in them that fear Him. Luke 1, 50, and His mercy is upon them that fear Him from generation to generation. I'm almost finished here. An eternal blessing upon those that fear the Lord. Revelation 19, 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Throne in heaven, where Christ ascended to, the throne of His Father. Praise our God, all you His servants, and you that fear Him. Now, get that. You that fear Him. From the least to the greatest. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters. As the voice of mighty thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Who are the ones that will be among this great multitude he's talking about here? The sound of many waters, uh, of mighty thunder, there's so many. The voices are so many. Who, who's in this multitude at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Who is it? We read it at the beginning. Those that fear him. That's who's going to be there. A church of people that will not fear the Lord will also not make themselves ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I tell you, they will not. But they are rather attempting to enter in without a wedding garment on. And when that man was seen, he was bound hand and foot and cast into the lake of fire. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. It's all, it all depends on us fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord. Well, I fear the Lord, but I also fear my boss. I understand that. But who do you fear the most? I saw where a man died. That man, that man's wife and children had gone to this church many years ago. He told her, if you don't leave this, that church, we were in the old church then, I'm going to divorce you. Who do you think she feared? She left this church. She feared him more than she feared the Lord. Well, he's he's making the money. You know, I live in his house. He divorced her anyway. Whatever you lose, whatever you leave God over, you'll lose. Hear me that. Hear, hear when I say that. Whatever you lose, leave God for, you will lose. I'm I'm telling you, it's written in stone. You can't keep it. You put it before the Lord. I have to be careful, but I had two daughters. One of them passed a long time ago. Nothing, none of that, none of that paid off for anybody. None of that. I watched it over and over. Will you stand with me? I watched it over and over, folks. You and I, we will all be tested on who do we fear. Who do we fear? And in the coming days in this nation, we're going to be severely tested on who do we fear. Who do we fear? But they that fear the Lord, oh, praise God, they'll not lack or want anything. His eye is upon them. His blessings are upon them. Three Hebrew men, young men, had to decide, do we fear the king or do we fear the Lord? And they went into the fiery furnace. Daniel had to decide, do I fear the lion's den or do I fear the Lord? What he's saying is, which one? Do I love the Lord more than I love my life? He went in the lion's den, and the lions never touched him. The fire never burnt, not even a smell of smoke on those three young Hebrew men. 
But some, some have lost their lives because they feared God more than they feared man. And they're losing them today. But what a reward awaits them. Let me tell you something. We're all going to die. Unless the rapture takes place first and we're ready. We're all going to die. Lord, help us. Praise God. We're asking you, Lord, this morning for a holy spirit of fear of the Lord to come upon us and to rule our lives. That we'd rather die than disobey you or displease you in any way. We fear the loss of your, of your relationship. And we're not fools thinking we can do what we want to and you're still going to have a relationship with us. I know that doesn't work. I know it doesn't. My own self. Praise God. If you come and stand, we want to pray for you this morning. Praise God.